Carefree Church, everybody. It's so good to see you. Shout out to those of you who are watching online. I'm so glad you tuned in. Why don't we stand up and get ready for worship? Y'all ready to worship with me? It's so good to see everyone. Why don't you greet someone next to you? Let them know how happy you are to see them and maybe how good they look this morning.
How we doing? And good morning, Carefree Church family online. Well, today is the day that small groups officially launches, everybody. And if you have not signed up for a, you can clap for that. Go ahead. That's awesome. If you have not signed up for a small group yet, there is still a chance for you to do so in our lobby or on our website after service at carefreechurch.com. And now we're going to be giving back to God. And if you're visiting with us this morning, this service is our gift to you. But if you call Carefree Church your church home, this is where we give our tithes and our offerings. But before we do so, let's pray. Lord, this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it always, God. Thank you for just allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for waking us up, giving us an opportunity to worship you freely. We not only dedicate our time this morning to you, but the first fruits of what you allowed us to have. And God, I just pray for a special prayer over Israel right now, that you put your hand and you protect them and you guide them, and we know that you have already won the war. We thank you in advance. We love you. In Jesus' name, everybody says amen. amen. Now check out the screens for what's coming up next. Good morning, Carefree Church. My name is Jacob, and we're so glad you're with us this morning. If you're visiting with us for the very first time today, we have a gift just to say thank you for being here. Stop in the center of our lobby at the information counter to get your free gift today. And if you're watching online, click the Connect With Us tab, and we will send you your free gift anywhere you are in the world. Now take a look at what's happening next here at Carefree Church. Sharing life is a part of our design, but meaningful relationships aren't always easy to find. That's why small groups exist, to make these life-changing relationships relevant and accessible to you. Our spring semester begins the week of April 14th, and signups are now available in the lobby and on our website. Make sure you join a group today. On April 28th, during both services, we will be giving you the opportunity to dedicate your child to God. Child dedication is a commitment by parents to do all they can to raise their child to love and serve Jesus. If you would like to dedicate your child, just fill out the form in the bulletin, or you can register online by clicking the events tab at carefreechurch.com. Also on the 28th, following our 1015 service, we will be having a water baptism. If you recently decided to follow Jesus, water baptism is the next step in your walk with Him. If you're interested in being baptized, just fill out the form in the bulletin or online at carefreechurch.com events, and someone will contact you with all the details. Hey parents, make sure you save these dates. July 8th through the 12th will be our kids' day camp for ages three years through fifth grade. This year's camp is going to be amazing, complete with songs, dances, games, crafts, food, and more. Your kids will experience a fun, exciting, and a creative week. Visit carefreechurch.com and click on events for all the details. For more information about everything happening here at Carefree Church, go to our website and click on the events tab. Thank you so much for stopping by today. We will see you next week.
stand with us as we continue to worship this morning.
forgive us when we've made it about ourselves, Lord. Let everything we do point to you. Let us point others to you, to the cross. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love. You're such a good shepherd who takes care of your people.
may be seated. Hey, good morning. Thank you for doing that. I'll give you your $20 after the service. I really appreciate that. See what you missed out on? I mean, hey, hey, it's good to be back with you. Usually, I'm only here when it's like 147 degrees. And uh, I feel like I've hit the jackpot. I mean, come on this weekend, how beautiful it is. Uh, so glad you're here this morning. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, uh, my name is Mike. Uh, if I haven't met you before, it's because you rarely come to church. Because I, I seem like I'm here all the time. So uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, Dwight asked me to fill in for him today. And when he told me the title of the sermon series that you're working on, that you were created for more. You have more to life. And I got real excited about that because I'm reading uh, uh, some obscure passages of Scripture in the book of Isaiah and the book of Ezekiel where it talks about Lucifer. Now, talk about the devil. I'm not going to talk about the devil today, so just chill out. Uh, but it talks about Lucifer. I don't know if you knew this, but Lucifer was the first worship creator, the wor first worship leader of heaven. Did you know that? He was a worship leader. And, and I, I found out that when I was reading about this passage of Scripture that, that God created inside of his body stringed instruments and timbrels and uh, cymbals and flutes and horns. And, and it kind of gives a picture that when he moved, worship emanated out of his body, which is pretty cool. And if you want to find some really obscure passages of Scripture, read uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28 are just some really fascinating parts. But what you find out is that he was such a good musician, he was such a good worship leader, that the Bible says that pride and hubris, uh, arrogance got into his heart, and he decided that he wanted to be equal with God so that he could receive the worship. And as a result, the Bible says that he was expelled from heaven, which means that there was an opening in heaven for a new worship leader. And as you read the New Testament, what you realize is, guess who gets to fill that spot? Us. We get to fill that spot. So right up front, I want you to know this. You were made for worship. Right up front, I want to talk about worship today. I've talked about a lot of kind of things when I've been here before, but I thought what I would do today is since this sermon series is you were created for more, I want you to know that God created you for worship. And, and so what I want to do today is talk about worship. I don't want to talk about styles. I don't want to talk about preferences because I know you have your favorite song. And I know that you've got your favorite group and you've got your favorite styles. And, and, and if we're not careful, what we happens is when we start talking about worship is we begin to try to impose our own personal preferences upon other people. And we say, no, 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 this is really worship. The lights have to be down. No, 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 for the rest to be real worship, it has to be, lights have to be up. And so we're not going to talk about preferences, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of our time talking about preferences, but what I would like you to know is that the Bible never talks about style. It never talks about lights up or lights down. So I'm not going to talk about it either. So what I thought I would do today is instead of defending styles and preferences and what you like and what I like and what I think is better worship and what you may think is better worship, I thought maybe the better question would be this. And it says on the screen, what kind of worship does God like? I mean, what captures his heart? I mean, what kind of worship does he respond to? And, and the good news is we don't have to wonder about what kind of worship he likes because he actually wrote a book in the Bible, and it talks about the kind of worship. And he uses a lot of different authors to write this book, but primarily it's the book David is the author of the, most of the chapters in this book. And the book is called the Book of Psalms. Now, in the Hebrew word, psalm means a book of songs, songs of worship. And just for your information, uh, the Book of Psalms has 150 chapters in it, which makes it the largest, the largest book in the Bible. And I think 
God did that for a purpose because he wants us to know just how much worship is important to him. And if you read through the book of Psalms, uh, what you'll discover is this, that God's preferred style of worship is, I don't know, it doesn't look like what happens in most churches on Sunday morning. Instead, God's preferred style of worship, in the best way I know how to describe it, would kind of be like Friday night lights in, in Texas. Football. It's kind of, I mean, I'm a Texan. I mean, you should know that by now. But, but I want you to know that God's preferred style of worship, is, it's more like a, a Friday night football game where there's celebrating and there's cheering and there's clapping and there's shouting and there's hands lifted and there's exuberance and there's a loud, loud band. And, because it's really apparent when you read the book of Psalms that God's preferred style of worship is probably not what happens in most Sunday morning services, but it's more like what happens at a football game. And so when I was in seminary, I had to learn Hebrew and Greek, and that's the two languages the Bible was written in. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and the interesting thing about the Hebrew language is this, that there are more words in the Hebrew language than we have in the English language. And and on top of that, the Hebrew language is very pictorial. It, It paints a lot of images. And so one word in Hebrew, it might take a whole paragraph to actually define what that word means. So the people who translated the, the Hebrew into English, they had a difficult time translating the Hebrew text. And so what they would do very often is, like most translators, they would find the simplest root word and they would simplify all the language down to the simplest word. So, for example, in the book of Psalms, you'll see the word praise. And what you need to know is, it says on the screen, that the Old Testament translators They took seven completely different words. How many words? Seven completely different words, and they simplified those seven words down to one English word, which is praise. So, what I thought I would do today is give you a Hebrew lesson. Never done that before in all the times that I've come here. But I thought I would talk with you about those seven Hebrew words that are translated into the English word praise so that would give you an idea of the kind of things that God prefers in his worship. So real quickly, seven Hebrew words, I'll go through them real fast. The first one is the word halal. Now, the Hebrew word halal sounds familiar to many of us because that's where we get the word hallelujah. That's exactly right. But in every pastor's library across America and around the world, there's a book called the Lexicon. And the Lexicon is a a dictionary for Greek and Hebrew words. And it doesn't matter where you go in the world, if you look up the word halal in this lexicon, it says this, that it is to rave, to boast, to celebrate, and to be clamorously foolish. In other words, God really likes it when his people get excited about him. He enjoys it when we cheer for him. He likes it when we get enthusiastic in our worship. And, and, and I know that this is his preferred style of worship. Let me show it to you in Psalms chapter 35, verse number 18. It says on the screen that I'm going to thank you in front of the great assembly. I'm going to praise, the word is halal. I'm going to be clamorously foolish before all the people. Now, if you remember the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6, you remember David, he, they've, the Ark of the Covenant has come back to the people of God, and he wants to take the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, his capital city. And so what he does, it's been so long since they've had the Ark of the Covenant that they, they put it on an oxen cart. And they're taking the, the oxen cart and the Ark on the back of the oxen cart and it hits a rock and it starts to fumble and fall off. And a guy by the name Uzziah reaches out and he touches the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible says that instantaneously he died. Well, with fear, David says, man, I, I, I'm not going to do this. So he takes the ark and he places it in the house of Obed-Eden, the Gittite. And what he does is that the Bible says that his house was on a hill and that God blessed Obed-Eden. Eventually, David gets all the people together and realizes we're not supposed to be carrying the ark of the covenant on an oxen cart. It's supposed to have, be carried on the shoulders of the priests. 
So he gets the ark, and he gets the priest, and they start carrying it in. And David gets so excited that his wife, Michael, she is the gift that he got for killing who? Goliath. You remember, if you kill Goliath, you get the king's daughter and no taxes. I think I'd have taken the taxes. You know what I'm talking about? I just paid my taxes, right? So, she is standing around watching her husband get so excited about bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem, and David is dancing, he's halaling, he's being clamorously foolish, and listen to what Michael does. She says this, Oh, how the king has made a fool of himself, acting clamorously foolish. And the Bible says that from that moment on, Michael was barren and never gave birth to a child. Now, this may be a little cringy for some of you, but, but I believe our modern emphasis on moody, contemplative worship does nothing but protect our fragile egos. I just think it protects our egos. Because what I, when I read the book of Psalms, what I realize is that God likes, He accepts, He, he appreciates, He responds to, He adores. I'll go further. He deserves, He responds to when we go all out in our worship. And He gets excited when we get excited about Him. Now, I get it. We're older. Some of you are sophisticated. Some of you are edumacated, right? And I get it that sometimes in worship, we, 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 do, we just don't do that. But, but shouldn't you get just as excited about God than you do when the Cardinals score a touchdown? I mean, when, when, when they score, when Tiger Woods sinks a new putt, he pumps his fist and he gets all excited. I mean, in my office this week, everyone is wearing green and yellow for the Masters. They're just all excited about that. And God is saying, listen, I like it when you do that for me. I like it when you get excited about me. Why don't you halal on my behalf? Second Hebrew word is yada, not yoda. Not the little green dude in Star Wars, no, a yada. And yada means that we, we extend our hands in public. That's what we do. We, we yada. You watched on the video during our worship, you saw people with their hands lifted. That's, that's yada. And, it, and what it means is that, it, that if I were to ask you, how many of you are Christians in the room, so many of you would just, you would instinctively do what? You just lift your hands. I mean, that's just part of what we do. God likes it in worship. God appreciates in worship. God responds to us in worship when we lift our hands in worship. It's, it's as simple as this. And if God wanted us to worship him, and if he says in his word that he wanted us to worship him standing on our heads, spinning around with our tongue sticking out, if that's what he said in his word, thank God he didn't say for us to do it that way. But wouldn't it be our response to be yes? Because that's the way he would want us to worship. Because, it says on the screen, God gets to decide how he wants to be worshiped. It's not my choice how he wants to worship. It's just my job to understand what he wants me to do and to follow him. Now, people say to me all the time, well, Mike, does it really mean anything for us to lift our hands in worship? I mean, does, does lifting our hands really have a purpose? Yes. It means that we acknowledge that he is in our presence. I mean, it's the same thing when we're walking down the road and we see a friend and we do what? Hey, how you doing? I see you're here. It's good to be with you. The same as in worship, we lift our hands and we acknowledge. Here's what it says in Psalms chapter 63, verse number 4. I will bless the Lord as long as I live. In your name I will, it's in the, the word is praise, but the Hebrew word is what? Yada. I will lift my hands. Here's the third word, Barak. Barak means to bless the Lord by kneeling or bowing. If you're looking for a word picture, 
It's the word of, it's the picture of submission. It's, it's, a, it's the idea of being submitted to God. And in Psalms chapter 103, verse number one, it says this, bow, praise, barak before the Lord, praise, barak the Lord, O my soul and my innermost being. Submit, barak, bow down before his holy name. Isn't it interesting? That this one word that's translated praise actually can mean to be clamorously foolish. It can mean to lift your hands. It can mean to bow down. Here's the fourth word, zamar. Come on, say zamar. It just kind of rolls off your tongue. Come on, zamar. Man, musicians love zamar because zamar really means to strike the string. That's what zamar means. It means to make worship that we can sing to by strumming or striking the strings. How? With force. Come on, you got to love that. In other words, it's about a power chord. It's about turning up the volume on the amplifier. Come on. It's like Boston driving down. Come on. Come on. You know what I mean? Like, my love language is Boston. Is it not yours? It's, it's rolling down the windows and pretending I still have hair. And I'm going to go to the lake, and I turn Kansas. Carry on my way. Come on. It's, it's the strumming. It's, the, it's a rhythmic. It's, it's loud. It, it, and you need to know that God is a rocker. He's a rock and roll guy. He likes loud music. I mean, that's cool. He's a guitar dude. He's a guitar hero. I mean, it really, this, what, what it says, he says, it, listen, here's what it says in Psalms chapter 92, verse number one. It is sort of good. No, no, no. What does he say? It's good. It's good to what? Zamar. It's good to, to have the guitar way out front for the Lord to make music to the Most High. Zamar is loud, it's energetic, it's rhythmic. And listen to me, if you, <laughs> if you don't like loud rhythmic music, if you think our music is a little loud and raucous around here, can I tell you, you are not going to like heaven at all. <laughs> no, uh, listen, you think you're going to be a, well, I was going to say fat and chubby, but <laughs> some of us are already there. You think you're going to be floating around on a harp with little wings. No, no, no. You need to know that heaven is loud. Listen how John the Revelator, in Revelation chapter 14, verse number 2, how he describes heaven. He said, I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of what? Loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harps doing what? Zamaring, striking hard on the harps. Listen to me. Heaven is loud. It's louder than the loudest waterfall you have ever been around. Have you ever been to Niagara Falls and gone down in the boat? It's so loud you can't even talk to anybody else around you. Some of you are going to want to take earplugs to heaven. Why? Because God's preferred style of worship, you know what it's really like? It's like a stadium full of 50, 60, 70, 80,000 million people doing what? Celebrating, cheering, yelling, the band playing. And listen, have you ever been to the football stadium when your team is winning and you're jumping and you're yelling and you're screaming? Nobody goes to the microphone and says, hey. <laughs> guys are getting out of control here. Bring it down. Bring it down. No, at a football game, they don't do that. What do they do on the, on the scoreboard? Louder. Louder. Come on, get louder. Why? Because the energy that it brings. We don't, we don't pull it down. We try to jack it back up. The fifth word is this, shabak. Now, shabak means to shout. And as I was putting this message together, thinking about this word shabak, I, I started thinking about all of the times 
that I've been at concerts. I started thinking about all the times that I've been to sporting events, and I've yelled, and I've shouted, and I've fist pumped, and I've got all excited. And to be really honest, I'm, I'm sitting on my back porch working on my sermon, and, and I, I tell you, I just got a little bit convicted. And sitting on my back porch in, in the town that I live in, I, I, I made this conclusion, I made this decision that I will not shout for a sports team that doesn't even know my name and keep quiet for the God who made me. I'm just not going to shout for a team who doesn't even know I'm there and then be quiet for the God who made me. And everybody said, amen. amen. Why? Here's what it says in Psalms chapter 63, verse number 3 through 5. I love this. It says, your love is better than football. Your love is better than golf. Your love is better than your hot rod. Your love is better than hunting. Your love is better than, come on, better than your grandkids. He says, my lips will shabak, shout. I will shout unto you as long as I live and in your name. I will yada, I will live my hand. Six, number six is the word tauda. And I want you to notice that, that two of the seven words in Hebrew have to do with lifting up our hands. But this one, the first one is that we lift our hands to acknowledge that God is in the room. This one means we lift up our hands in adoration and in surrender. Like the first time I saw my baby girl, blonde hair, blue eyes, blonde hair sticking up, I came out of the womb. I didn't go, wow, she's beautiful. I went, wow, she's amazing. It's the first time you go to the Grand Canyon and you stick your, ed your toes over the edge. You, you don't go, oh, this is cool. You go, wow, this is amazing. It's what we do when we experience God. You say, God, we experience you. You're in our house. You're in our presence. And we go, God, you're amazing. You're wonderful. We've never experienced anything like this before. And, and I, I surrender. I mean, at the end of the service, sometimes the pastor will say, hey, if you need God to do something in your life, what does he ask you to do? Lift your hand. Lord, I, I just lift my hands and surrender to you. It's not about my will. It's not about the things that I want to do. It's about your will. Here's what it says in Psalm chapter 50, verse 23. It says, he who offers tauda, he who surrenders with lifted hands, glorifies me and that he orders his conversation aright, and I will show them the salvation of God. The last one, and I think this one is hilarious, okay? It's the word tehillah not tequila, <laughs> although it does the same thing. Because tequila means that you sing spontaneously. You sing, all your inhibitions are gone. And you sing unrehearsed. And here's what it says in Psalms chapter 34. I love this verse. I will extol the Lord at all times and his tequila, not tequila, will be always on my lips. Now, let me show you one verse where three of these different words are all in the same verse. Psalms chapter 57, verses 7 through 11. It says, O oh Lord, my heart is fixed. In other words, I'm resolved, I'm resolute, I don't care what anybody says, I don't care if anybody misunderstands me, I am fixed on you. And I will sing and give zamar, praise. I will praise Yada, lift my hands to thee, O Lord, among the people. And I will sing praise Shabbat to thee among the nations. Seven different words that's translated into one word for praise. Now, for those of you that are note takers, let me get you to really the thesis of this message today. And there's three of them. Number one, that worship is love 
expressed. Worship is love expressed. It's not love if it's not expressed. It's not worship if it's not expressed. And it's not worship if it's not love. Let me say it one more time. It's not love if it's not expressed. It's not worship if it's not expressed. And it's not worship if it is not from a heart of love. In other words, you can't come up to me after the service and say, mm, Mike, you know, dude, I'm really just not into worship. But I do love the Lord. It would be like me going to my lovely wife, Rhonda, and saying this, hey, baby, I love you, but no more gifts, no more hugs, no more kisses, no more snuggling, no more it's done, it's over, but I love you. I'm just going to tell you, that will not fly in my house. Wouldn't fly in your house either. So here's you, the note takers. Here's, listen to this. When we love someone, we should love them according to the way that they receive love. When you really love someone, you should love them the way that they like to receive love. It, the idea comes from a book by the name of a guy, a, an author by the name of Gary Chapman. He wrote the book, The Five Love Languages. And he studied the way that people receive love, the way that they get love. And he discovered that there are five primary ways. One is through words of affirmation. In other words, you, say, you know someone loves you when they compliment you. Or you know someone loves you when they spend quality time with you. Or number three, they give you gifts. Or number four, acts of service. Or number five, physical touch. And in his book, he asked the question, what would it be like if we love people the way they like to be loved? Now, my love language, the way that I show love to my family is by physical touch. And my wife says, that's just a guy thing. She goes, all guys are that way. But in my household, my wife and my daughter cannot leave the house without first coming and giving me a kiss. My daughter comes in the house, I'll be working on, my, on something, and she'll walk past me and go, hey, 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 hey. Come here, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. And, 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 and my, my daughter will walk in the room and she'll start doing this. Why? Because it's the way that I show physical love. Now, my wife's love language is not physical touch. My wife's love language is acts of service. She shows me that she loves me by doing things for me. And, and I don't have to ask them to do those things because she does them naturally, but it's just the way that, that she shows love. It's the way she receives love. Now, listen, I would rather her show me that she loved me with physical touch. <laughs> don't act like you don't know what I'm... <laughs> Bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> I would much rather her show me she loved me by physical touch, and she would much rather me show her that I love her by making the bed. <laughs> right? Listen, you need to know that God has a love language too. And what if we love God the way that he wanted us to love him? What would it look like if we expressed our love to him the way that he likes his love to be expressed to him? Because that really is the issue, isn't it? So what does God say about this? Well, in Mark chapter 2, and I'm coming to a close, on one occasion, a teacher of the law came and asked Jesus, of, of all the commandments in the Bible, which one is the most important? And Because that's really a good question because you need to know that in the Old Testament that there are about 613 laws. And so this young teacher was saying, hey, would you just simplify it? Break it down to what's really the most important. And here's what Jesus answered. The most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God... The Lord is one. Love the Lord, your God, with all of your what? Heart and with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Can I tell you that worship 
is the hardest thing you will ever do if you're really not in love with God. If you're really not in love with God, worship will never emanate from your heart. But, but if you are in love with God, can I tell you that worship, although it may be awkward and you may not have been taught about it and you feel uncomfortable, worship actually becomes easy. I find it interesting that God just didn't say, well, just love me. Just love me any way you want to. No, no, he didn't say that. What he did say is, I want to tell you how I want to be loved. He said, first of all, I want you to love me with all of your heart. It says on the screen that, that worship, we worship God by expressing our affection to God. I really want you to know that God's really not as concerned about the songs we sing, the tempo that we sing them in. What God really is concerned about is you. Because God, from the very beginning of time, has always been about you. He wants you to love him. He wants to be your highest priority. Now, now listen, here's what you need to know. God doesn't care that you love other things in your life. He doesn't care that you love golf. He doesn't care that you love whatever. What he cares about and what he expects is that he wants to make sure that you love those things secondarily to him. Because when we love him most of all, that's how we worship him. Second of all, he says, love me with your mind. In other words, God really likes it when we focus our attention upon him. It says on the screen, God really likes it when you think about him. So Tuesday, I'm, I'm driving to an evening appointment. I'm going to have some dinner with some people and my wife calls me on my drive to this appointment. And I pick up the phone and I say, hey, baby, what's up? I'm walking into a meeting, which is code. Anybody talk code? <laughs> what it means is I don't have time for all of the details. You know what I'm talking about, guys. It means get to it. Get to the most important thing because I'm walking into a meeting and I don't have time for all the details. And so I said, hey, so, so what do you need? And my wife and her so slow southern Alabama draw says, oh, nothing. <laughs> I just wanted you to know that I was thinking about you. Just wanted you to know that I love you. I wanted you to know that I miss you. And I can't wait for you to get home. Which was code. <laughs> Come on, that's code. How many of you know, man, I was about ready to cancel. <laughs> I'm canceling that meeting. <laughs> You can plan a church another day. My wife misses me. <laughs> you need to know that God loves it when we think about him. God loves it when you say to him, God, I'm about to walk into a meeting and I don't have a lot of time, but can I just let you know that I love you? Can I just let you know that I'm thinking about you? Can I just let you know that... that that when this meeting is over, I can't wait to have a little bit extended time with you because I just love talking with you, God. Here's the third thing. He says you should love him with all of your heart, love him with all of your strength. Now, my wife doesn't just need a lover boy. She also needs a lawn boy. <laughs> right? Hugs are wonderful, but dude, the grass, you need, to work, you need to work in the yard. Get your hands off of me, put your hands on a lawnmower. <laughs> That's what she's saying, okay? The same is true of God. 
The way that we show that we love God is by using our abilities, by using our talents, by using our strengths, by using our God-given gifts. We, we show that we love God by volunteering in the church. We, we show we love God by using the strengths to advance His kingdom. We show that we love God by getting involved, getting God involved with every aspect of our life. So I love God with all my heart, my soul, my strength, my mind. So I was thinking about how do we close out this service on worship? And, you know, the band is amazing. I wish I could just travel with these guys every week. But I thought maybe the best thing that we could do, that even though that we're sophisticated, even though we're super educated, even though we're mature, and even though we live on the north side of town, I thought maybe what would be God honoring this morning, that if you truly were made for worship, that what we would do is stand up and for 15 seconds, just pick one of the seven Hebrew words of praise and just go for it. Now, I just want to let you know, if we all don't do it, this is going to be awkward. <laughs> if it's just me, it's going to be awkward. So I want you to think about the seven Hebrew words of praise, shouting, shabak, kneeling, bowing, lifting your hands, clapping, celebrating, whatever it is. And what I'd like for us to do is right now, let's stand up. And I, I got my lovely little watch right here. And I, 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 15 seconds is all I'm asking for. I'm not asking for an eternity. I'm not asking for a year. I'm not asking for you to do this every time we come together. Good, just for how many seconds? 15 seconds. And, and who's going to do it? Ever, we're all going to do it. So pick your, your, your Hebrew word to praise. Are you ready? Get, get warmed up. Like maybe you got to maybe, maybe, maybe move a little bit, whatever you got to do. But we're going to go for 15 seconds. You ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Let's go. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah. We bless your name. We glorify you. Lord, we worship you. You are worthy of our praise. Come on, that's 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Hey, man. Come on. A little tequila there. Felt good, didn't it? Why did it feel good? Because you were made for worship. And when you worship, God responds. Let's bow our heads. Father, we love you this morning. Father, thank you for this group of people that, are, that obviously are in love with you. And God, we ask that we would be people of worship. Your word says that the hour is coming and is now where God is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And God, would we be those people, in your name we pray, and everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.
Oh man, it's so full. Calculating. Oh, calculating. Uh, is that the tracker for him? Yeah, that's so we know where Dwight, he's at. Dwight yeah, told me to make sure he's at. <laughs> you got seven hours and 24 minutes. Oh yeah, oh yeah. 